Okay, uh, now we're going to go through the middle vascular tunic. Um, may break it up um, and do the ear to corneal angle structure in its own, but we'll see how far we get without me stuttering too badly. Uh, so remember that the vascular tunic uh, is pigmented, it is also called the uvea, uh, and uh, we'll go through the parts and then some of the fine structure uh, right now. So uh, we can think of the uvea as being divided into the anterior uvea uh, and posterior uvea. The posterior uvea is also referred to as the choroid. Uh, so we'll just go through piece by piece and talk about the different elements. So we'll start with the iris. Uh, this is the, uh, the part of the eye that gives you or your dog or an elephant uh, the color, so to speak, of the eye. Uh, and it is composed of melanocytes non-pigmented stromal cells, lots of blood vessels, um, and then some epithelial modifications, which we'll discuss in a little bit, are actually anterior projections of the neural retina, although we consider them to be part of the ciliary uh, or irritable um, uh, portions of the uvea. Um, so we don't want anybody to get confused about that, so we'll go over it a couple of times. But let's zoom in and we'll get to know um, the parts of the uvea. So we can see sort of spindly uh, black or brown cells, which are melanocytes. Uh, they give the, uh, for example, the dog's eye its brown color. We'll look in just a second at what a cat's irritable melanocytes look like. Uh, we've got nerves, we've got blood vessels, um, and those are the general components of uh, the uvea regardless of where you are. Um, the anterior face of the iris can be identified in most animals by a non-epithelial, so this is not a pigmented epithelial layer, but it is a layer of melanocytes which forms a, in, in many animals will form uh, a layer along the front which can be helpful in identifying uh, the extent of the iris. Um, in a blue-eyed dog, a husky for example, or uh, in an Australian uh, cattle dog that has a blue spot in his eye, uh, this irritable stroma and anterior face will lack pigment, uh, and if it's a full full blue-eyed dog, so will the choroid, uh, but the posterior uh, epithelium or the iris pigment epithelium along the back uh, has pigment in all animals except for true albinos. Um, so you'd actually need this pigment, as Dr. Murphy mentioned in class, to give the blue hue to an eye, even if there's no pigment in the stroma. Uh, if you didn't have any pigment here, as in a true albino, your eye would look sort of pink. Uh, then at the iris base, we move into the ciliary body, which itself is made up of two parts, the pars placata, which is the squiggly part, and the pars plana, which as the name implies, is the flat part. And again, we've got a stromal com component, and then the inner aspect is lined by epithelial components, which are actually anterior extensions of uh, they're contiguous with the retina and the RPE, retinal pigment epithelium, although they were not they no longer have a neural function. Um, so the ciliary body also has a muscular component, which in the dog is uh, a little bit more diffuse uh, than, say, in a, in a human that has to do a lot of accommodation. But you can see these bands of smooth muscle, which are responsible for accommodation. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, the stromal elements are similar. We've got pigmented melanocytes, non-pigmented stromal cells, uh, vascular uh, structures, some arteries, some veins. Um, uh, and then we'll talk about the lining in a second. Um, well, we'll start with that because we'll, we'll start, we'll do the outflow uh, right now. So we've got our inner uh, epithelial linings of the ciliary body. At the innermost aspect is the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium, and this is where aqueous is produced. So these cells are very metabolically active and they're pumping uh, an ultrafiltrate uh, out into the posterior chamber. That is the aqueous humor, uh, and it is the balance of aqueous production and drainage which is responsible for maintaining intraocular pressure. Aqueous is made by the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium, secreted into the posterior chamber where it circulates around through the posterior chamber, out through the pupil, it circulates around into the anterior chamber, and then enters the mystical region known as the ear to corneal angle, which we will demystify presently. In most domestic species, 
the anterior limit of the iridocorneal angle is the pectinate ligament, uh, which is a uh, cellular lined but uh, connective tissue beam that connects the iris base to the end decimase membrane. In the normal animal, you should not typically see an entire profile of the pectinate ligament all the way from iris base to cornea. Uh, it's a very perforated single ligament, so it's one ligament that goes around the whole eye with a lot of holes in it. And in a single histologic section, you just aren't supposed to see the whole thing. Uh, so once you pass posterior to the pectinate ligament, we go to what most people would call the ciliary cleft, which is this trapezoidal sort of space, um, which gives the irritocorneal angle its sort of open appearance. Uh, we'll look at it in the cat in just a minute. As it comes out into here, uh, once the aqueous gets into the ciliary cleft, it has two choices. It can go through the traditional outflow, through the cornea scleral trabecular meshwork here, so named because it is at the junction of the cornea and sclera, um, at which point it is filtered. Uh, this is where the resistance occurs. Uh, they've shown this experimentally um, that the cornea scleral trabecular meshwork is the primary site for regulation of aqueous outflow. Um, and then from here enters into the angular aqueous plexus, which is the junction with the systemic vasculature, which is the end site of aqueous drainage. Out through the irritocorneal angle, most of it comes through the corneoscleral trabecular meshwork in most species and then makes it out into the angular aqueous plexus and then continues into the vortex veins uh, and out into the circulation. Alternatively, aqueous can move backwards into the uveoscleral trabecular meshwork, which is a little bit harder to define, but it's this wispy uh, wispy stuff sort of in between the bundles of smooth muscle and then as we discussed extensively in lab it will move into the supraciliary space and here's the supraciliaris uh, just a little band of tissue um, that uh, plays a role in defining the space and assisting with the drainage of fluid uh, most of which will eventually whether it's here or further back in the supracoroidal space Sorry, just got to go back a little bit further. Supracoroidal space, and once aqueous enters the uh, the supraciliary or supracoroidal space, it can be absorbed by uh, uveal vasculature and end up back in systemic circulation, but through a different route. Uh, the proportions of uh, aqueous that drain through the different routes is not important at this point in your career, but you'll learn more about that in... Uh, in third year and in clinics. Um, at this point I'm going to conclude and we are going to deal with the choroid uh, and the tapetum. It's one of its modifications in the cat. So this concludes the anterior uvea. Uh, we'll move on to posterior uvea uh, aka choroid in the cat in just a minute.